Hey guys, how are you? So I'm gonna answer an email that was put to me. And basically, how do you build an app from scratch? What is the plan when attempting to build an app? Like for instance, starting by creating the base classes of the program and then instantiating the objects and then dot, dot, dot. What is a step-by-step -step plan you would do to create software? Can you please make a video about this? It would surely help us. All right, so I'm gonna assume that you're talking about software with a front end, with a visual component, a website, a web app, could be a mobile app, etc. So the approach that I found that has worked best is the first thing you build are the views or the screens. Now the screens, you know, the visual component of your application, well, again, whether it be desktop, mobile, or web, you gotta build the screens. Well, so why would I build the screens first? because you want to get in front of the uh, stakeholders, the people who are gonna use the app, the people who own the app. So perhaps you're working for clients, you're a freelancer, and you're building a web app for them, or you're building a mobile app for them. First thing you do is you wanna show them a bunch of screens that you're gonna build. Uh, so let's say you're building an online store. So first thing you do is you sit down with your client, and it could be you, you sit down and you write down the requirements. What information, what's the main use case? What are you doing? We're selling products. What kind of product, products? Are they digital? Are they physical? Are they both? Then you gotta look at what do you need, what do you need them to do to buy the products? Well, you're gonna have to hook up to a payment gateway. You might use PayPal, you might use Stripe, or you might get your own gateway going. There's all kinds out there, so you can directly talk to credit card companies. That's another option. Uh, that's one thing you have to do. And then once you have the, the basic use case requirements fleshed out for your particular application, then you need to uh, sit down. If you're building an application that has a bunch of visual screens, lots of views, then you draw light sketches of the views. You know, what's the first screen that people see when they hit the, when they hit the application? What's the second screen? What's the third, fourth, fifth, et cetera? And you do all this. And the reason you do all this is so that it really helps to flesh out the use case from everybody's perspective. I assume if you're doing the work as a developer, you're working with people who may not necessarily be developers, especially if you're freelancing. But even if you're working with other developers, by showing the screens, it uh, really helps you to flesh out the functionality and the use cases that you're going to need for your particular application. Once you've done the screens, the next step is not the objects. Next step is the database. Now, whether you're using an SQL-based database or a flat file system like a Mongo or something, you still have to map out your database. Once you got your database done and you got your screens, your views done, then you can start mapping out your objects, the broker, uh, the communication between your views and your database. Now, for most application development, it's all about capturing data in forms, processing that data so there's no malicious stuff in there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then sending that data into a database for long-term long -term storage. That's kind of the basics of it. So it's data collection, data processing, middle layer, all your objects and so forth, your JavaScript code, if you're doing something with Node or something, or it could be your Python code, et cetera. And then you store that in your database. And, and then when somebody comes back to the site or maybe some other user, the other end of the, the uh, process, the other use case is to present the data that you just collected to the end user. So that is uh, pulling data from the database, bring it out, processing it, massaging it, and displaying it, displaying it in the view. That is basically what the um, application development process is all about when you especially if you're working with other people and you got a visual component to your application this is of course a little bit different if um, you're just like writing drivers for hardware or maybe you're writing algorithms for some AI or something then it's a whole different thing because uh, then it's a lot easier in a sense because you don't have to int you don't have to talk to um, or well, the use case rather, is uh, not so much dependent on some user interacting with the system in a visual way or directly. If you were just writing pure code, again, I would look at what is the, uh, I would look at the use case 
and look at the functionality that has to be expressed in the code. And then I would start coming up with my base classes uh, or even better, my base, uh, yeah, my base classes, my base classes. One thing, when I talk about object-oriented programming, and he mentions base classes, so he's talking about OO, you don't have to write your software OO, but most of the time, that's what you're gonna be doing, that's just the way it is. Of course, there's functional and procedural programming, and you can argue there's, there are times when it makes sense to use procedural or functional, but most of the time, you're gonna be writing some sort of OO. Now, Controversially, I have stated for many years now that I'm not a big believer in the full OOP stack, if you will. Uh, specifically, I'm not a huge fan of inheritance. I don't think inheritance should be used often. Inheritance should be only used on a very rare occasion when you have infrastructure, an infrastructure level of objects, if you will, that are, are not mutable, uh, meaning they don't change at all. Uh, typically, when I say you have your base classes, and then what you do is you use interfaces, and you use a decorator pattern uh, to uh, expand upon that base class level. Why? Because if you start using a lot of inheritance, you're going to have brittle code, brittle code, code that easily breaks. I've seen it in real life several times. Now, in theory, if you follow best practices, you shouldn't run into that situation where somebody goes in there and changes a base class and then breaks up breaks everything down the hierarchy. Ideally, that's what it, how it will work out, but in reality, it doesn't. What you ought to do is you create your base classes. Uh, the lead developer should do that, kind of setting the tone, if you will, the basic structure of your application. Everything else should be expressed through interfaces, which gives you an advantage of having a controlled paradigm within your application layer, but you're not tightly coupled to your base classes, meaning you can change your base classes and not break, break everything. Uh, one of the goals, one of the holy grail goals of software development, of course, is um, code that is non-brittle, code that can be uh, swapped in and out and moved around and used um, independent of the application at hand. This, unfortunately, rarely happens because people write code that's too dependent on uh, the application or the context in which they're building their code initially. What you ought to do is try to write code that is very fine-grained in its uh, in terms of the objects, meaning the objects should be very much uh, limited to a particular narrow scope of activity. So for example, I would have an object that only deals with sending emails. That's all it does. It doesn't validate. It doesn't do anything else. It just sends emails. That's it. So you have this black box code, which, you know, especially if you have a bigger team, you want to write code like this. So you have this black box that just sends emails. And, it, and you have it, and it present and it has a certain interface uh, in terms of it expects certain pieces of information that you're going to define, um, and that's it. You should have another object that handles validation, right? And you should have another object that handles persistence and messaging. Why? You could put it all in one object, but then you're introducing brittle, brittleness into your code base, and you're asking for trouble. But by keeping it very fine-grained and separate like this in terms of the individual, we'll say, use case, use cases, uh, then you can find yourself reusable components here, right? You're gonna have that also in that email component can be just reused, boop. That validation component could be just reused, boop. I have experience with this back in the 90s for my, uh, I wrote my own Java-based MVC framework, a very lightweight. It was based on the 80-20 principle, uh, meaning 80% of uh, the headaches are derived from 20% uh, 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 of the function, if you will. Um, so instead of trying to solve every single problem with my framework, I just tried to solve that crucial 20% rather. I don't know if I said it properly before, but anyway, I tried to solve that crucial 20% of the code that created 80% of the work. And it was very successful for me. So it was a very lightweight framework. So I had auth authentication objects, um, email objects. I had... Um, uh, I had my data layer objects. I had my uh, UI widget objects. I used to have uh, objects that, that would just create very particular uh, UI components that were data bound. So for example, if I wanted to present uh, a list of options from a select box, 
uh, that was bound to a database call, I had an object that just did that and that's all. And it accepted a, uh, a basic type of array. So I could consume uh, data from a relational database, I could consume from JSON objects. It was very flexible in that regard. Therein you have reusable code. I'm going off on a tangent here. When you're building uh, most applications that have a view, you want to use set defined uh, defined patterns. The common ones, MVC is by far the most popular. Um, in the MVC, if you're not familiar with it, it's a standard way of building any type of app that has a, a user interface. So you have the model, which is all your, your data layer. You have your uh, view. Uh, which is the you know the skins the the views the things that you see in web apps would be the web pages the HTML the CSS and the JavaScript to a certain extent and you have the controller MVC now the controller is the throwaway code the controller is a code the layer of code that brokers the interaction between the view what collected and displayed in the view and what's held in in uh, the, the database if you're good about writing code. You're going to be able to re reuse view components and data access components and filtering components, authentication components. That brokering code in between, that is not going to be reusable. I can guarantee you that. But here's a great thing. With frameworks, uh, web frameworks like Python has Django. Uh, you got the .NET, the web uh, framework. I don't know where we're going with that. You know, Java Spring, um, Python, uh, excuse me, PHP Laravel, Ruby Rails, um, they've done all this for you. So you can just work on your uh, business logic for your particular application. Again, that's for visually oriented applications. If you're building lower level code, like device drivers and so forth, again, my advice to you is just you write out your base classes and then I would leverage interfaces after that. If you don't know, let's look up what an interface is. I actually talked about, I actually give demos. If you look at my YouTube channel, just type in, I think, interfaces. Interfaces versus um, inheritance. And you can see I give cold examples and some re refactoring somewhere on there. I have 1,700 videos on YouTube, so yeah. Uh, yeah, let me read that line again. Like, for instance, starting by creating a base classes. Yeah, base classes, you know, again, Based on your, you know, what are the, what are, what's the key use case? What's the key functionality you're going to need for your app? Uh, of the program and instantiating the objects, and then, uh, yeah. So you create your base classes. Don't use inheritance. Use interfaces. Fine-grained objects, uh, meaning objects that have very one use case, and then if you need to break out, break out as I just described. Um, yeah, and leverage frameworks that are out there. There are frameworks for web apps. There's all kinds. You know, I just mentioned a handful. Um, and in, in other domains, there are frameworks. Like I know for uh, UI building and so forth, and iOS and Android, they, I'm, sh I'm sure they got frameworks and libraries that are standard practice of you, and you leverage that. Reuse, reuse, reuse is top three rules of coding, uh, from my experience. Again, this is leverage. I'm going back, you know, leveraging my 30 years experience uh, since I started writing code in 1994. So yeah, there you go. I hope that helps. We'll talk soon. Bye. I decided I'm going to do something super rare I don't ever do. I'm going to provide a coupon. Oh, wrong side. We'll be on this side. I'll provide a coupon for 50% off my Python course. This is the Studio Web Python course, interactive, teaches the foundations of Python, including object-oriented programming, basic game, uh, design, well, text-based game, but still. People love the course because it's so easy, and you'll be doing it within my Studio Web platform, which is interactive, gives you instant feedback, lots of quizzing, coding, uh, theoretical questions, instant help. If you're a noob when it comes to programming, if you're a total beginner, this is a course for you. If you're learning Python for the first time, this is a course for you. It's There's no quicker way. This whole platform I developed makes learning how to code much, much easier. Anyway, as people know who follow me, I rarely do this, but I figure it's Halloween, and I don't know why, I just said 50% off, crazy deal, and it will be good for about three, four days. All right, thanks for watching, bye-bye. 
So you stayed to the end of the video. All right, so what I'm going to do is give you a sneak peek at my new video book, The Lizard Wizard. This is a blueprint, a schematic, the uh, key to the way your brain works. So it's called The Lizard Wizard because you have a major part of your brain is called The Lizard Brain. Anyhow. So I have many lizard lessons, lizard wizard lessons. Lizard wizard lesson number one, don't join a tribe for maximum clarity. So I'm not gonna give you the whole thing here, the whole chapter here, but just a snapshot. Our brains, our brains are designed to join tribes. And if you think about it, think about people who support one football team or basketball team or uh, hockey team versus another. So if you're a big fan of New York, uh, New York fans will hate, I don't know, Boston fans, etc., etc. Why is this the case? Because the way our brains are designed is to join a tribe for protection. Think about it, you know, 10,000, 20,000 years ago. And if you saw somebody from another tribe you don't, you don't really trust them, right? Because uh, back 20,000 years ago, you'd probably get killed, right, by the other tribe. So that tribalism is buried deep into the operating system uh, of our brains, and it colors our perceptions of reality. It really has a huge impact, you would not believe, which I'll cover in the Lizard Wizard book, uh, well, video book. So how do you deal with this and should you deal with this lesson number one we're tribal lesson number two if you perceive yourself as being in one tribe your brain will auto automatically make other tribes seem evil negative and literally and this is proven in the science which you'll see literally your brain will transform your perceptions of reality based on your tribal affiliations and as such, your perception of reality will be altered and skewed. So how do you escape from this? Don't join that tribe. So since we're nerd-oriented here on this video, you know how some people are pro-Windows or pro-Mac or pro-Android or pro-iOS. And it's kind of calmed down now, but there was a time when Mac people would get into huge arguments with Windows people. Or uh, Java people would get into huge arguments with C Sharp people, etc., etc., etc. So to avoid being caught in that trap, what you should do is not join any tribe. So what I do uh, is, for example, I use Windows, I use Mac OS, I use Android, I use iOS etc 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 so by not joining a tribe you free yourself of these emotions these lizard oriented emotions which will give you a clear reality of what's actually going on in the world around you this is very profound a little bit too much to cover in a five minute addendum to a video but uh, a lot more will be covered in my lizard was of course all right talk soon